Thank you so much for waking up early on your public holiday. Um, I thought I'd just be talking to myself, so that's great. Um, uh, Jeremy did an amazing job, but I'd just like to also uh, pay my respects to the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. Um, particularly today, today is a day of mourning, uh, and it's never a celebration, and we all stand with you. Uh, also, I need to do a bit of a disclaimer. Uh, Anxiety is a real medical condition. I am not trained to tell you about that condition. I'm more talking about existential anxiety. Um, so just bear that in mind. If you have anxiety, go and see a doctor. They'll help you more than I can. Um, okay, this is true. My name's Nio. Uh, you say it, Nio. Um, this is my studio. Uh, I am a designer. I do a lot of book design. Um, this is for Thames and Hudson. I'm just going to show you a bit of what I do, then I'll get into the actual helpful shit. Um, I do some illustration work. This is for Bando, Penguin, Lenny Letter, Cool Set Design, my favourite records, favourite hotel. Uh, and I'm also the founder and director of Make Nice, which is an online community and in real life conference for creative women, um, self-identifying. Uh, we started in 2016 uh, with a three-day conference. Um, look how beautiful I'm reader is. Um, we had another conference in 2017 in September, uh, and I've just caught up on sleep. So uh, it's, it's a lot of work and I love it, but uh, here we go. Okay, my talks about things I've done and what I've learnt, uh, and most of them have helped me develop a kind of life where I can feel fear and anxiety and use it for good instead of letting it stop me doing things like this talk. Um, one, it can take time to figure out what's right for you. Um, I have done two degrees. The first degree was a fine arts degree, uh, and as soon as I finished, I realised that I don't really like talking about myself, which artists have to do a lot, and right now, I'm doing. Um, so, also I had a bit of this. <laughs> so, um, I think that a lot of people put so much pressure on y younger uh, students, high schoolers, 20 year olds, it's so good. Um, about choosing something that you have to do for the rest of your life. I've had three career changes and I've and just passed 30 uh, and none of them were mistakes. They're all great. So if you're 50 and decide to change career, fucking do it, you can do it. Um, two, teach yourself new tricks. So uh, I didn't stick with the fine art, but the lesson that I learned in that degree was that you can teach yourself things and that for a project, it shouldn't be limited by what your skills are. It should be the concept first, then figuring out how to do whatever it is you need to figure out to do. This is an example of um, how I did that. I'm going to explain, don't, don't worry. Um, so I met with this art director from the New York Times on a Friday in New York, uh, and she sent me an email later that afternoon saying, uh, the KKK are doing their first public rally in 30 years, because thank you, Trump, and um, we want to do a project about what costume you could wear at a KKK rally that would protest the KKK. So my thought process was, uh, I'm going to make the exact same costume, but completely clear, because the whole point of that costume is to be anonymous and be able to be hateful without being known for it. And this is about being loving and open and honest, and um, so I created this, slight hitch, I've never sewn anything, I was in New York, I flew back on the Saturday, arrived on the Monday morning, the deadline was Wednesday, uh, I learnt how to cut a pattern, 
learnt how to sew, had numerous very awkward conversations at Spotlight. Um, yeah, it's a priest costume, but clear, and also a dunce's cap, but clear. Um, I had never done a photo shoot before. I needed to find a photographer, a model, a space to shoot it all within 48 hours, and I did it. Um, if I was listened to being anxious and scared about not, do it, not knowing how to do anything for the biggest client I've ever worked for, uh, I wouldn't have said yes. Um, but I did, and it's great, and she loved it. Um, so that's a good example of it's okay to do something you've never done before. Three, you can love your work and still want more. So after um, my fine art degree, I worked as a curator and gallery manager at a private art gallery in Australia. It was an amazing job. I got all these cool perks. Um, I don't think I paid for a drink for five years. It was a rude awakening when I finished working there. Um, but after a while, it got to the point where I just wasn't being challenged. And it was the first job I've ever had that usually I kind of leave in a huff and just like don't turn up to my next shift. So I, uh, this was the first job that I loved but still knew that I had to leave. And it took me a really long time to figure out that that's okay. Um, so you can love something and you can love the job and you can realise that it's not perfect for you and move on. Um, and it's, it's completely um, scary to do. But once you do it, you're going to feel so good. Four, get comfortable feeling uncomfortable. Um, so while I was at the gallery, because I was not feeling challenged, I decided to do a design degree full-time while I was working full-time because I'm insane. And um, I studied somewhere where I wasn't feeling very um, challenged. They weren't really... I was like a, that typical, horrible, like, semi-mature age student that was just annoying all the teachers all the time. Um, so I decided to save up money and go to the Rhode Island School of Design for a semester. Um, you can't do exchanges, you have to pay for it, which is because it's too good to do an exchange. Um, this is their nature lab where you can go and draw any animal anytime. Um, I just needed a photo for this. So I am a massive introvert, total homebody. Um, I don't like talking to people like that I don't know at all, um, which is, again, stupid today. Uh, I put myself on the other side of the world without my partner, um, living in a dorm room um, and eating horrible, horrible <laughs> American food. Um, they didn't have normal milk for the cereal. They only had chocolate milk, just to give you an idea. Um, but it was worth it. It gave me, like, a shock therapy of, like, feeling uncomfortable all the time and that it's not a sign that you're not meant to do it. It's okay to feel uncomfortable. Get kind of comfortable feeling uncomfortable if you want to grow as a person. Five, be a fangirl. Um, these are some of the things that I love that aren't design or, or illustration. Um, and I, when I, te I teach at UTS in, in Sydney, and I think that a lot of people now focus on what they're career is, but they're not interested in, in life in general and they don't follow their curiosity and that actually makes them worse at their job. Um, if you're a designer and you're not interested in anything other than design, your design's going to be shit because you have nothing to pull in from anywhere else. Um, so these are some things. Added bonus is that I've gotten work from people knowing that I like these things. I've been able to draw rock things because people that I talk to about rock music know I like rock music. Um, feminist theory is obviously quite a big um, kind of interest of mine, so I get a lot of jobs with people that I really admire. Um, so just be interested in everything. And it also creates um, another kind of thing that I didn't put in here is to be interesting, you have to be interested. Um, so that you can't be a cool, interesting, wonderful person to talk to if you don't like hearing from other people and learning from other people. Six, figure out your not negotiables. Um, I went to a talk of Debbie Millman's a couple of years ago. She has an amazing Creative Mornings talk that you should listen to if you haven't already. Um, she essentially was talking about asking people, what is the one thing that you want more than anything? And the kicker is that usually it has nothing to do with your career, right? So Debbie's... Um, if you don't know who Debbie is, she's pretty much like one of the best graphic designers in the world. Um, she said that in, in retrospect, her not negotiable wasn't being a designer or being an artist, which she had said she thought she'd compromised on, you know, 30 years earlier. 
Her not negotiable was living in the city that she loved. She wanted to live in Manhattan. That's why she decided to become a designer over an artist. Um, and my not negotiable is to live a great day-to-day -day life. I want to be able to travel. I want to be able to enjoy every day instead of saving that until I'm 65 and can finally go on that trip, you know. Um, so try and figure out what your not, not negotiable is and guide your career based on that. Um, it's kind of hard to figure out originally and it can change um, and you've got to try and just have one, which is hard. Seven, make it an ideal day every day. So part of my not negotiable is having a great general day, right, which is why I started working for myself. Um, I run just a one and a half person studio. Uh, so I did a kind of woo-woo secret Pinterest board of like what I wished my day looked like um, when I started working for myself and it looked nothing like my actual day at the time. Um, two years later I looked at it again and it was pretty much spot on what I was doing. Um, so my perfect day starts with cold brew. I walk my dog. This is Iggy Pup. <laughs> I have like a very like extravagant homemade long breakfast. I go to Pilates. I put on a record. I put on real clothes, which I don't need to take a photo of. Um, I start working and in the morning, so I usually start working about 7.30 because I figured out that that's where my brain works the best. Um, and I tackle the hardest thing for the day. I tackle something for like four hours in a row, just that one task, try and turn my internet off. And um, then I go for a swim. I live at Clavelli um, in Sydney, so sorry. <laughs> um, this is the beach that I live like 200 metres away from, so I try and take advantage of it. Then in the afternoon, I do uh, admin because my brain stops working very well, so I do boring banking, emails, all that kind of stuff. I write a list at the end of the day what I need to do the next day so I can just jump into it in the morning. I use one of my way too many cookbooks. I read a book or, more likely, this happens. <laughs> Um, <laughs> so that's what my ideal day is like and the, the cool thing is that you know maybe 80% of the time that is what my day is like because I'm kind of structuring my day around that not negotiable um, and I dare say it looks better than a lot of people's normal days so I'm kind of stoked on that. Eight and that might not be what your ideal day is like but try and think about what it is and, and kind of put in those changes. Ask for help and do it well. So when I started working for myself, I did not know what the fuck I was doing. I would send a lot of very respectful cold emails to people that I really admired. Um, and now I'm really good friends or, or good colleagues or have collaborated with almost all of them. And the trick is, I think, to uh, not expect them to take you from zero to 100. Expect them to take you from 70% to 80%. So I would ask them a very specific question that they can answer easily. And then when they do answer it, thank them. No one ever writes back uh, thank you or writes a note or anything like that. So I often get um, people emailing me saying, so how do you run a conference? Uh, and that's like, how am I meant to answer that? But if you ask me, you know, oh, I'm also looking for a venue for 200 people in this area. Could you tell me what you found it, you know, when you were looking? That's easy for me to answer. Super happy to help. Oh, damn it. I, yeah, there's my little gif. Uh, nine, sign a contract, always. Um, I have fucked this up so many times. So it, it's very awkward and you feel really anxious asking people to sign a contract, especially if they're like your best friend or you've worked before or they're your dream client. Um, and it's awkward and it's anxious and you don't want to do it, but if you do it, you'll save yourself so much more anxiety if it goes wrong. Um, I have not done this numerous times and it has not worked for me every single time I haven't done one. Oops, I'm getting off. Ten, worrying means you suffer twice. So I was on the plane and watching... It might be just the extra plane emotions, you know how you cry a bit more when you're on the plane, but I was watching... Um, Fantastic beasts and where to find them. And uh, Eddie here says, um, worrying just means you suffer twice, right? I'm a big worrier because it turns out, if you listen to, I just read a book by Rebecca Solnit and she says, 
Worrying is essentially what control freaks do when they're trying to control things that they, that they can't control. Um, and I was like, oh, shit, yep, that's me. Um, so, and there's also this kind of statistic where 80% of the things that you worry about never actually eventuate. So for 80% of them, you're worrying once and giving yourself like anxiety. And then for the 20% that does happen, you're still doing it twice, so it kind of doesn't make any sense. So this way of thinking about it has actually helped me quite a bit to, to tone down the, the worry in the head. 11, start before you're ready. Um, if I had any idea how much work nice, make nice would be, uh, there is no way it would exist. Um, I had no idea what I was doing. Um, and it gives you a bit of anxiety when you start because you don't know how you're doing it. But it also means that you create... I'm really proud of what I created at Make Nice because I didn't follow the, the rules that you're meant to follow when you start a conference. And that's why I think Make Nice was so special because um, I took all the things that I liked about other conferences, I took the things that I hated about other conferences and kind of tried to figure it out on my own how that would work. Um, and obviously you don't have to do it in such a public <laughs> manner as I decided to do. Um, but just even if there's something that you want to try, just do it on your own privately for a little while and see how you go. Because there's, I'm a big proponent of starting before you're ready because then you don't really know what you're in for and you can't talk yourself out of it. Um, Twelve. Magic happens when women gather together. Um, obviously, I believe in this because I started Make Nice, for God's sake. But um, women are really conditioned from childhood to compete against each other. It doesn't matter how much of an amazing feminist you are, it's still in your head there. And I still think these things sometimes. And it, you actually need to train your thought patterns <laughs> to stop thinking that way. So when I started kind of reading about this when I was a, a bit younger, um, I realised that I was judging women so much more than I was judging men. And um, I just start, when I think those thoughts now, which I don't do that much anymore, I think, wait, why am I thinking that? A great example is Nicole Kidman. Always thought I hated Nicole Kidman, thought she was a horrible actress. Then I was like, I watched something with her in it and I was like, wait a second, she's fucking amazing. It's actually just the media telling me that she's horrible because she's succeeding at what she's doing. Um, and I'd just like taken that on without even thinking about it. Um, turns out she's great, guys, if you didn't know that. <laughs> this is like pre, uh, what's it called? Big Little Lies, yeah. Um, there's ultimate, there's unlimited pieces of pie. There's not one piece of pie for one woman. That's weird, you can't make a piece of pie. You have to make a whole pie. Uh, it's a pie buffet. Um, 13, use your privilege to lift others up. Um, it doesn't matter what your job is, you have privilege and it's such a privilege to use that privilege. So um, just as a normal human being, listen and respect the experiences and stories of people of different genders, race, class, socioeconomic status, physical or mental ability. Um, if you're a speaker, I have had to send this email to a couple of conferences and they kind of have to do it then. Um, so otherwise they look really bad. So, um, and it, it also is a lot of people just don't realise that they're doing that. So just letting people know and making, it, um, making them aware. If you have a big social media platform, use that platform to add amplify voices that don't get heard. If you're an illustrator or an artist, draw people that look different to you. Um, it's something that you have to think about doing. Um, I went to a talk by Gina Davis and she said something along the lines of, even in the background of movies, 65% of the people are men. Like in animated movies, 65% are made up as men. That makes no sense. Wouldn't you make 50%? So just things like that when you're an illustrator and you're drawing white people all the time, um, change it up. Make, show, show something different. Um, and if you're uncomfortable in a client project uh, about something that you're being asked to do, explain it really respectfully to your client and they will understand. They don't want to be dickheads, <laughs> you know, most of the time, um, hopefully. Um, oh, what does that mean? Um, someone's birthday tomorrow is a warning. Um, and don't expect a thank you for this. This is just stuff, this is like baseline humanity, guys. So do this when you can. 14, 
put down your phone. Um, last year I started, um, I was really terrified doing this, which is so pathetic, but I would put my phone outside of my bedroom. So I couldn't look at it at night time when I was going to sleep, couldn't look at it in the morning when I woke up. Um, that took a while to get used to. Now I turn my phone off at eight every night. Um, and then a few weeks ago, I went to New Zealand and did not look at my phone for three fucking weeks. It was amazing. I didn't call anyone, didn't look at anything, didn't Instagram. Um, and it was just absolute bliss. I'm not like, a, I love my phone, like don't get me wrong. But this is so helpful for your mental health and also for your creativity. So you can just do it in a little two hour block or one day on the weekend, but you don't need to go like all out Milford sound hike, no phone thing. But um, it's really helpful to kind of build into your life. 15, no one knows what you want to do. You need to tell them. Um, I am recently learning this. So um, I would often wonder like why I wasn't getting the kind of jobs that I wanted or, or new things that I hadn't done before that I wanted people to randomly ask me to do. Um, I started talking about some of these things that I really want to do. Um, yes, one of them is ice cream parlor, if anyone. Um, so I started talking about this maybe like three months ago and by March this year, I've, I'm already doing four of them just from talking to people about it. And it's not like I'm like accosting people on the street. Like when, when someone's talking about things like this, I will mention it in, in the conversation um, and it works. 16, you are going to die. Um, this is very depressing, but very true. Um, lots of people had a very bad 2017. The world at large had a very bad 2017. And I was no exception. My father, who was my favourite person in my life, got diagnosed with cancer and died within three months. Um, he was super healthy, 60 years old, and he just passed away within three, 12 weeks, 12 weeks. So, obviously, that's the worst thing that's probably ever going to happen to me. And, um, and I really would love to take it back. But there are a few lessons that I've learnt. One is you can't control anything in your fucking life, even if you're a control freak like me. Um, I went to a therapist for the first time and my first question was, so how can I grieve, like, really well? Like, <laughs> how can I do it faster and better? Um, <laughs> You can't. Uh, and the other lesson is, yeah, you are going to die. And it might be, like, in a year, you know. It might be in ten years. And the people you love are going to die. And why would you spend your life doing something you didn't want to do and not enjoying yourself when you can make your day even, like, 10% better? Um, because <laughs> it's not that long <laughs> that you get to live. And why would you wait until retirement to do the things that you care about? right? Even if it's you have this job and you need to keep the job for whatever reason, but in your, in your spare time, do the things that you love like every day, like in the afternoon, after work. I know you feel shit, but just go for that swim or whatever you need to do. 17. So this um, works all of those tips into the last tip, which is you're going to feel fear and anxiety anyway. It's like hardwired into you. You're going to feel it every day, probably for the rest of your life in some way or another. Um, but if you take that fear and use it as a kind of sign that you're going in the right direction, um, then it's actually a great kind of sign of growth. Um, so when I'm scared of something or, or fearful or anxious, they kind of feed into each other, fear and anxiety, I think. Um, I kind of think about why I'm feeling that. It's usually because I'm growing or I'm being challenged or I'm doing something new and that's exciting. So it's actually fear and anxiety is a great thing to be feeling because if you're not, then you're probably just a bit too comfortable. Um, so I've been doing this feel the fear and do it anyway, which I found out when I was writing this talk is like a truly horrible looking self-help book, which I wish I'd put on this now to Susan Jeffers is the author. Um, <laughs> And uh, I've been doing that and it's been working really well for me and I think that it might work for you too. Thanks.